Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I have the privilege and honor of inviting and introducing Dr. Sangeeta Menon from the National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore. She is going to speak on a subject which, according to me, is, the most com is one of the most complex and the least understood subject. The topic is beyond the brain, the unifying force of consciousness. Now the concept, the brain itself, the structure as they said, with billions of cells, with trillions of firing of neurons in between, remains still the most complex machine one can think of. And consciousness, I don't think till now we got anything which can say that we have even attempted to understand it. For decades, for years, or rather I should say for centuries, this topic has engaged and very distinct uh, hypotheses and theories have emerged. Rather, to my mind, there are four distinct theories on these subject and they are all in contradiction with each other. One of the most popular, which is very popular with our institutions, scientific institutions especially, treating the mind or consciousness merely uh, what you call epiphenomena of electrochemical actions going out in the brain. Our thoughts, our emotions, our love, our hatred, our godliness, our saintliness, our devilliness, whatever is, it is merely a question of some chemical here and some chemical there. By adding a chemical here, in theory, or re removing a chemical there, a godlike person can be made into a villain, or a villain into a godlike person. The other theory talks, no, no, it's all consciousness and nothing matter. They say, all mind but no matter. Matter itself is a creation of consciousness. The third is what you call the dual. Oh, both matter and mind are two basic concepts in the universe and this was given about four centuries back by Descartes and somehow he was able to find a small pineal gland in the brain through which mind was acting on matter. And the fourth is from the Vedantic philosophy who say this is no duality, it is all one, the ultimate reality reflects or itself as matter or itself as consciousness and when they interact it's event and Leela and what they call Ananda. Anything? I leave this study, this debate or the talk to Dr. Sangeeta Menon who is probably the one of the few who has conceptualized and started a school of consciousness studies in Bangalore. It is definitely very bold of her. It's a very bold attempt on her part of her in amalgating modern science of psychology with the ancient Indian philosophy is spelled out in Bhagavad Gita, Upanishads and the Vedanta. She did her PhD, she did her, uh, the thesis for her PhD was in the field of consciousness in Bhagavad Gita. I invite her to take this. Namaste. Good evening. At the outset, uh, my gratitude to the respected president, Mr. Tim Boyd, for having me here in this beautiful campus. And, and I still remember the morning I saw that mail and I thought, oh God, I'm really lucky to be invited to this campus which carries mysticism and blessings for one whoever would visit this place. Thanks to Maria and all other friends uh, for helping me in various ways and uh, really very nice meeting Mr. Jaiswal who is uh, very excited about the topic of consciousness and we have shared some ideas and I look forward to uh, learning from him uh, on the subject. Uh, well, uh, this is uh, at the same time a technical topic as well a topic which involves each one of us heart. So it's very much possible to speak about consciousness through hearts as well as using 
uh, framework which involves technicalities. Perhaps I would combine both components from both these methods and present to you some of the ideas which are in the mainstream scientific thinking, which also have implications uh, in terms of the philosophical attributes of it, the spiritual uh, attributes of it, and finally, how does it impinge upon each one of us sitting here? What does consciousness have to do with our lives? What does consciousness have to do with changing our lives, bringing more smiles to us and more cheer to us, more joy to us? Well, uh, since I'm also a student of the Upanishad and the Upanishadic philosophy of this country, uh, you would perhaps know this very famous uh, verse from Mundaka Upanishad, a little story. It's a really very nice little narrative. The narrative talks about two birds, two beautiful birds sitting on a branch. And what are they doing? One is sitting quietly watching, watching something. You don't know what is being watched, but watching. And the other bird going around looking for something and doing many things in the process, perhaps biting a seed, biting a fruit, or perhaps looking at another bird. So very busy. So there's this story of two birds sitting on a branch, one very busy, and the other just looking. This particular verse has inspired many philosophers, many thinkers, and people like us to think about something which is deeper and to also think about the possibilities of the human self, that at the same point, we are able to do very many things, being very active in an interactive world, at the same time, perhaps to sit quiet, to see something which is otherwise not perceivable if we are lost in a very busy world. So this is the Muntaka Upanishad verse, and it's a beautiful Sanskrit verse, uh, which inspires us. Well, friends, uh, we can say that the journey into understanding consciousness started with the dawn of human life itself. Of course, here I mean in a more evolutionary scale and uh, also since the use of language and uh, the disciplines such as biology, philosophy and psychology have helped us understand the nature of consciousness in a very emphatic manner. But how far have we reached or how far have we traveled from such a scenario of uh, the advent of language and the advent of academic disciplines such as biology, neuroscience, neuropsychology, and so on? That would be very interesting to see. Mostly following the falsifiability principle, which is very important in science, we have gained new wisdom and discarded old ideas and complex concepts that relate to the biological organ, which we call as the brain, and the psychological entity, which we call the mind. In this journey, we have also understood what is called as the person, the self, well, the neuroscientists would call it the synaptic. There's a very famous book called The Synaptic Brain, or The Synaptic uh, Self, where the self is all interpreted as the networked brain. Or we may call it as the neocortical entity, what we understand as the mind. We may also say perhaps what is deeper within us can be understood only in terms of the unconscious, which of course many psych psychologists are like, Freud and others who have talked about in very many ways, we may also say there is something which is deeply spiritual, which we are yet to understand in terms of experiential manner, and perhaps not completely in a more epistemological or knowledge scale. In short, there is an inescapable presence, P presence with the P capital, that gives meaning to the coexistence of a psychological entity called the mind and a biological entity called the brain, which we would like to perhaps talk about as consciousness. But it's important that 
uh, to re remember that when we talk about consciousness, we also bring in a deeper idea of the person, of the self, right? Whenever we talk about self, either we turn inward or we look up something higher or something deeper or perhaps something which is all pervasive as well. Without such an idea, there is no purpose for the existence of the brain and the mind. We cannot legitimize our inquiry without a deeper self to experience, to discover the uncharted space of consciousness. Essentially, the traveler in the sojourn of consciousness is the person, the deeper self itself. Such a self brings us the mystery of consciousness, its origin and nature, by pointing to the limits of the physical and psychological structures that we know through the mechanisms of the brain as well as the mind. Friends, the major puzzle that consciousness presents to us today is in finding the evading agent. Who is the agent of your action? And the enjoyer in and through the experience. When I say the enjoyer, I mean the person who is experiencing it. We use today brain imaging techniques, encephalograms, radioactive tracer dyes, clinical diagnostic tests, cognitive and AI experiments to trace the contours of the agent of action and the experiencer, knowing very well the possibilities as well as the limits of such technologies and methodologies. A very good uh, writer, on brain, Richard Rastick, he writes, a little bit of a mocking tone, can the brain understand itself? There is no way for us to stand back and objectively observe the brain or even theorize about it without encountering the constraints that are inherent in our neuronal networks. To what extent can reality or truth be ascertained when the inquiring organ, the brain, itself exhibits significant perceptual biases that can never be altered. Well, the crux of the puzzle that consciousness carries with it inspires us to conceptualize ways in which the brain and the deeper self can mutually challenge each other. Consciousness is fringed by both neural attributes, which are of the nature of the neuronal structure and the neurochemical mechanisms that's going on every second in us, as well as the attributes of the deeper self. At no point we can say that what we understand as consciousness can be entirely understood or comprehended exclusively in a neural context or exclusively from the context of the person. Because we have a brain, we have a body, at the same time, we have something which is deeper, which is beyond the neural mechanisms. So that's why many uh, researchers today would admit that consciousness, uh, oh, sorry, the brain is not an isolated biological organ, where biology can stay away and talk about uh, something in completely, purely biological terms but it is a brain which is challenged by your deeper self. We also agree to a large extent that it cannot be, the deeper self cannot be an abstract entity that reveals only through experience, but it is to be also seen as challenged or influenced by the biological brain. Hence, the common agreement is that better methodologies to understand consciousness will have to emerge from positing the brain-challenged self and the self-challenged brain as the heart of the problem and not viewing the brain and the self in isolation. Without the brain, we may not have the cognitive capacities to inquire into the intricacies of biological complexity that influence the sophisticated existence of life. Without the self, there is no joy. Without the deeper self, there is no joy in inquiring into the most challenging and unpredictable organ of our body, which is the brain. <laughs>
But at the same time, it is a deeper self, the person which gives us what is humanly called as fun and joy in our life. The final frontiers of consciousness are the brain and the self, the deeper self. Some of you would have heard about the heart problem of consciousness, which is kind of technically representing the complexity in understanding a subject like consciousness. Well, there is a harder problem of consciousness, which is about our deeper self, about you and me. Well, the self in the brain and the brain in the self might also require us to see the brain not just in the vat. You know, for a biologist, what is a vat? And the self not just in a cultural uh, scenario. The abstract possibilities of the unknown self surprise us experientially and also therapeutically beyond the confines of biology and culture. The brain and the self are cross-wired in a fashion that challenges these to decide the course we take to locate consciousness. In the process, we concede with the biological imperativeness of an evolving brain and an emergent self. The greatest challenge before consciousness studies is to ask and then to proceed to chart clear pathways that begin with the physicality of the neural structures of our brain and conclude with the deeper subjectivity which is in the center, which is in the core of our experience. Well, this is all an almost impossible task. But then with this task, there are also some very important questions that arise. Is the brain hardwired for each sensation separately and without change? What is the nature of the intervention of the conscious agent and its role in building adaptability? What is the role of memory as the bridge builder between physicality of the brain and the subjectivity of our deeper self? How do the brain and the self together create the conspiracy of experience where the physicality of the brain is lost in the subjectivity of our core self? At no point during our experiences or any experiences, we think about the brain or that it is all, all produced by the brain. We have no knowledge about the neural structures, the neurochemical mechanisms going on. What we all have is the knowledge of the experience that we go through. So there's a very interesting theatrical, I would say a theatrical backdrop which is created by the brain completely hiding what is going on inside, which may be not very interesting anyway, which is all because of neural structures and neurochemistry, but presenting to us beautiful experiences of joy, humor, fun, etc., etc. Now, the experiments on plotting neural correlates of mystical experiences, because when we talk about experiences, there is a very huge component on mystical experiences as well. So there are experiments which are going on to plot the neural correlates of the brain of mystical experience. And this is only uh, perhaps a decade or two, not even more than that, it's just 10, 20 years. <coughs> Commenced by the initial work of people like Newberg, Andrew Newberg, some, uh, some of you perhaps are familiar with his works, and with the advent of sophisticated brain sensing machines such as fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, and SPECT, single photon emission computed tomography, certain experiences which are termed as mystical are being increasingly addressed by the neuroscientists. This new approach to study mystical experiences is called technically today as spiritual neuroscience, whether we like the name or not, it's called as spiritual neuroscience. And like other branches of neuroscience, this particular discipline considers mystical experiences as well to be mediated by the brain. Because in neuroscience, you cannot talk about something keeping the brain away. The brain has to be hand in hand. And then perhaps you talk about possibilities. Well, the turn of the new millennium has seen the emergence of spiritual neuroscience. And this 
discipline of scientific investigation is at the crossroads of psychology, religion, and spirituality, and of course, neuroscience. The main objective of this domain of research is to explore the neural underpinnings of religious, spiritual, and mystical experiences, what they call as RSMEs. One of the basic assumptions of spiritual neuroscience is that these experiences are definitely mediated by the brain. And uh, of course, it's of paramount importance to fully appreciate that elucidating the neural substrates of these experiences does not diminish or depreciate their meaning and value and that the external reality of God can neither be confirmed nor disconfirmed by delineating the neural correlates of such experiences. Two of the uh, prominent studies locate the temporal lobe, the orbitofrontal cortex, and the parietal cortex to be the source for the micro seizures that are responsible for the experience of mystical experiences in Carmelite nuns. Uh, I, I, I can give you the references for this later if you're interested. And also in Franciscan nuns, these studies were done in 2006, 2001. And the alterations which were felt during mystical experiences, according to these studies, are the resultant of the involvement of several brain regions and systems. According to Newberg, who is a very strict neuroscientist, he says, which of course we may critique or we may welcome, he says, if God does indeed exist, the only place he, well, he says he, it can be she as well, he can manifest his existence. The only way he can manifest his existence would be in the tangled neural pathways and the physiological structures of the brain. Re well, recent studies and the connections between the brain and God have brought in a humanizing picture of the brain. Instead of seeing the brain as a completely biological structure, people can now also start talking about perhaps some element of religious experience and spiritual experience in conjunction with the brain. Newberg's study on the neural correlates of meditative experiences of the Tibetan monks have particularly shown change in all the association areas and in particular less activity in what is called as the orientation association area or the prefrontal cortex. It is to be also said that these studies with amazing details of the human capacity to form a self and to continuously extend its limits have been made possible by the advancement in brain scanning technologies. As I told you, this is another area which has kind of advanced in multiple degrees and which enables us to understand the brain in much subtler ways than earlier. Well, the history of the mind studies has greatly favored a naturalistic interpretation in order to compare with something which is structurally closer. But then by this approach, do we undermine a phenomenon which is uniquely central to the human experience in order to favor a comparable other in the natural world? Well, studies conducted by Newberg and D. Equally carve a different space amongst the increasing number of brain theories of mystical and religious experience. They suggest a continuum that ranges between the experience of baseline reality and profound unitary consciousness, which is absolute or which we can perhaps term as the unitary being. The absolute unitary being experience is marked by clear neural signs such as increased blood flow to the prefrontal cortex, which is the area of concentration and decreased activity in the orientation association area in the parietal lobe. The decreased activity in the orientation association area is responsible for the sensation of losing oneself or expanding its boundaries. And I think at least two, or perhaps many of you sitting here, we have a similar experience of expanding the boundary 
of the self which we are aware or perhaps an experience of unable to remember what we what you are truly what am i truly so where is the deeper self where is our core self is it just a figment of our mind produced in cooperation with the brain activity what is the relation between the brain and the body how does the trio of the brain the body and our deeper self work together to give profound experiences that are connected with a unitary consciousness well many scientists many neurobiologists talk about the neural correlates of consciousness what is called as the ncc which is basically identifying different neural structures or identifying certain neurochemical properties of the brain and then equate those regions or those neurochemical properties with what we call as our day to day experiences uh altered experiences or even transcendental experiences now if not asked otherwise the notion of body which we have is something given and natural to us but perplexity arises not just in terms of understanding but even experiencing when we reflect upon the possessor the user and the witness of the body the very first thought on these three relations bring to us the question of embodiment uh, well we don't have to worry about a term called embodiment it only means that body infuses into anything that which we experience or anything that which we uh, anything that which we engage in in our day to day life is embodiment or the presence of body is the is a primary experience of course it is bound by certain extremities such as the exteriority of the skin and the interiority of the private mind is embodiment that which gives us the distinction of outside and inside with which we live right and yours and mind yours and mine both fine tuned by a distinct sense of me and the rest of the world isn't it whenever we talk about consciousness even in a very uh, perhaps a perceptual plane we cannot understand our experience or we do not make sense of our experience without the basic div- division of me and you or the inside world of myself and the outside world which we are experiencing in any experience that is the first to come the me and the other but for some the boundaries of me are perhaps restricted for some it is much more expansive and for some the boundaries of the other are also restricted and for some the boundaries of the other is encompassive and there are various philosophical uh, uh approaches to such a idea in terms of even poetry and narratives that uh if you want to really see the expanse of the god perhaps the limit of the me has to be expanded i'm i'm suddenly remembering a malayalam poetry but i i think i'll restrain myself from uh talking about that poetry uh well today when much of phenomenology inspired uh, cognitive sciences have saved the body from being just a tissue muscle physical thing to something which is more subjective one is still struck with the notion of a discrete disconnected and deconstructed body whose agency is defined around exclusive cognitive and neural functions rather than organic expressions so one limitation of cognitive sciences as you would see today is experience itself is restricted to mere physical uh, sorry mere perceptual experiences which is vision hearing tasting etc so the basic sensations but uh, a major critique for that kind of an approach in science is that most of the time my experience is not that i see a red rose but i see a red rose and then a lot of things happen after that right 
in few seconds. The red rose brings me a lot of memories, which perhaps takes me to my childhood, or perhaps which uh, will bring me the memories of my beloved, or perhaps bring me the beauty of the world which is around me. So such an organic notion of even a simple experience of having, uh, of seeing a, a rose is not possible for to be accommodated in a strict scientific methodology. Well, the question here for us to ask is, is that the limit of the scientific methodology or is it a limit of our experience or the possibility which is around us? Well, science would say that if we have to practice science, you have to limit all those encompassive experiences into something which is perhaps uh, limited to a lab environment. Well, many of us would uh, not appreciate something like that, at least in our experiences. We want to see something which is more encompassing and which is more inclusive. So a major challenge in consciousness studies is in terms of how much we can include, how much we can exclude. The, one of the most exciting things about the scientific approach to consciousness is that, that it has become more inclusive. Unlike perhaps the sheer medical documenting style of understanding consciousness, which was prevalent uh, 100 years before. Today, consciousness is understood, or at least the attempts are made in science to understand in terms of narratives, personal narratives. So the story of you and me are very important for science to understand consciousness. That's amazing, isn't it? Otherwise, narrative is something which we would talk about in literature and philosophy. But today we talk about medic medical narratives which are very interesting to learn about, to understand. Friends, if you look at consciousness studies as a larger stream of academic discipline, you would see that there are certain basic questions which science attempts. The first is the very simple question which you and I would like to ask, which all of us would like to ask, which is, what is consciousness? How do you define consciousness? We have to remember that in our way of, in a, the way which we are trained in acquiring knowledge, in acquiring understanding, our first uh, attempt is to define. Define, locate, and keep it somewhere, right? Whether we come back to it to understand further is a different question. So defining is very important for science, what we call as operational definitions. You, you operationalize it so that you can understand better in terms of limited number of concepts and limited, perhaps, a limited methodology. So what is consciousness? Defining consciousness is an extremely important business for science. And can you imagine that today there is still no consensus in science about defining consciousness? But what is uh, the humor, the humorous part about is that since there is no consensus on the definition of consciousness, people bring in a scenario of different ways of understanding consciousness, which itself is very beautiful. Because though the idea of science is to restrict consciousness, to reduce consciousness into a few predictable terms and concepts, since in science itself there is no consensus, the focus in understanding consciousness by very many scientists brings in very many vantage points to look at consciousness. So you get very many vantage uh, outlook towards consciousness and in that way you understand consciousness from very different uh, viewpoints. So defining consciousness is continuing to be a challenge and uh, a few people think you have defined consciousness but not to science because you see that science itself is so very uh, divergent in pinpointing a focused definition for consciousness. Now, okay, let us say that at least you accept a few definitions for consciousness. What is next in science, at least in the scientific approach? You have defined consciousness. Take, for example, consciousness is what is produced in the brain. Of course, that is very uh, less imaginative, 
and there is nothing more to go beyond that. Of course, so people, you know, say a few, few more things other than that uh, consciousness is just neural. But let us take uh, a, a definition such as that. Consciousness is something which is uh, to be connected with the brain. The next question would be, where in the brain is consciousness produced? And you would already see the dilemma and the difficulty because science still progresses on a cause-effect cause relation. If you need to explain something, you need to explain in terms of causal relation. What has produced and what is the effect? I'm not, sh I'm not sure whether we have gone beyond really remarca remarkably well on a cause-effect relation, a causal re relation. Though we know that the complexity of consciousness is much beyond a cause-effect relation, something which produces and something which is produced. But still, to our uh, perhaps sometimes uh, great surprise and sometimes great mirth and sometimes a little bit sadness also, you see science pinpointing to certain structures as the origin for consciousness. Of course, one may ask, what kind of consciousness is originating from that point of brain? Because brain itself is a complex uh, entity which you don't understand. Now, a few set of uh, researchers would ask you a third question, which is, why do we need consciousness at all? Can't we understand all which is around us without invoking the concept of consciousness? Well, perhaps this is one question which has perhaps faced maximum critique because fortunately there are a whole lot of people in the world today who thinks that consciousness is a concept which is very much important to be existi existing in order to invoke our imagination. Deeper imagination, not just imagination, deeper imagination to connect oneself to the rest of the world and finally to point to us some unitary feeling which will liberate us from that small me feeling. So when science tries to perhaps bring consciousness to understand the identity which is limited to the body and the mind, alternate disciplines and understanding consciousness, spiritual experiences, philosophical traditions, and uh, some, some sub-disciplines of psychology is, is interested in understanding what is the core of yourself? What can you call as the core? Is the core a small point? Well, at least some of the cognitive scientists think about what is called as the minimal self. The minimal self is a strictly a biological unit which is important to give us the sense of being an agent and also the owner of our experiences. Of course, neuropsychiatry has benefited from this very important concept of minimal self because um, in cases of schizophrenia and other uh, psychiatric challenges, the minimal self gets affected and the authorship and the ownership of an experience gets confused and also gets attributed to some other agency or some other object. But the concept of minimal self also has a whole lot of problems because it is not able to it is unable to explain what we call as the core. When we call, when we address the core self, we have to remember that we are not talking about a minute little thing existing somewhere in the brain or somewhere in the world, but it is a core self which connects the entire universe and brings to our mind in terms of a small experience. In each experience which we have, this second, for example, the whole universe is conspiring on us. The whole universe is falling on us. But perhaps, as one of the very famous uh, Upanishadic verse says, we have been created with certain manufacturing defects or manufacturing limitations, that our sense organs are always pointing towards the outside world and therefore unable to see inside. Avritta Chakshahu. Some of you would be familiar with that. That is not there, perhaps, for the body which is created in this uniform, in this, uh, uh, in this human form. So the concept of the minimal self faces a lot of critique when we come to understanding the core self in terms of deeper imagination, 
deeper existence, organic existence existing along with the nature or perhaps ex understanding our existence in, in the context of nature. Well, the fourth question is, how is consciousness existent in terms of perhaps an evolutionary scale? And this is where people bring about the uh, importance of language and culture, that what we call today or understand today in, in scientific uh, disciplines as consciousness is a product of language and the evolutionary history which you and I have carried. It is the result of culture. Culture has played a huge role in human interaction, interaction between two people, and going beyond perhaps what is otherwise basically defines the animal kingdom in terms of finding food or finding a partner. So culture, human culture, has uh, helped us go beyond what is the basic necessities of biology, being an animal. So culture also perhaps is a very important aspect in understanding consciousness. This is one of the views of at least some of the philosophers. Well, these are the four questions, which is uh, kind of uh, uh, in the periphery as well as in the mainstream of science, namely how do we define consciousness, which is a very important uh, and a complex question. And uh, if at all we define consciousness, where do we find it? Because anything unknown has to be given a place, right? If somebody says, uh, if someone introduces you to, uh, with a name and so on, and you have not seen that person, one possible question you would have in the second se sentence is, where do you live, right? Somebody unknown also has to be placed somewhere. You need to know the neighborhood community of that, place, uh, that person. So in the same way, perhaps, the, perhaps the way our human mind thinks, that science also interested in the whereabouts of consciousness. Where is consciousness located? So the what, where, why, and how. But are these four questions enough for science to understand the complexity of consciousness? Perhaps not. And that is why a fifth question is equally important, namely, who is talking about all this? Who is talking about all this? But in order to have an answer for that, we need to stop talking for a while. That's why it took a few seconds, uh, you know. Because in order to know the speaker of what is spoken, in order to know the thinker of the thoughts, which ourselves are not aware most of the time, right? Many of us are having many thoughts. If, we ask a, if, if I ask one, some of you to count, list the number of thoughts in the last... Uh, Two minutes, how many of us will be able to do that? Very difficult, because even we don't know what are the thoughts going on. So how do we understand the thinker of the thoughts? So that is why the question of who is talking about all this is very important. And that is where I would think philosophy, spiritual experiences, mystical experiences will have a lot to do. Because the only way science can find a balance is by being humble towards understanding alternate experiences, alternate possibilities of human experience, human existence. But that does not mean even for a second that science is not important. Without science, we will not be able to make clarity of all that confusing things which are going on in our mind all the time. Because the best part of science is that it gives us clarity and it gives us focus. And the best part of an attitude towards a possibility, which we may call as philosophical or spiritual, is that it allows us to see something which is beyond with a lot of courage. It, doesn't, it is not that science is not having courage, but science is limited by method and definitions. Let us face the fact, even in this century, Science is limited by the method and definitions. It can go only where the method takes. So you see the progress in science also defined by method and technologies. That's why technology become very important for science to prosper. 
I would call as the fifth, the, the fifth question in consciousness studies, namely, who is talking about all this? The who question, the what, where, how, why, and the fifth, which is who question, is extremely important for consciousness studies. Because the who question at the same time allows us to bring in science and scientific developments in order to understand something which is very complex. And at the same time, the who question helps us to imagine, helps, us each, helps each one of us to imagine beyond what is given to us, what is perceived by us every second. So you need both the neural correlates of consciousness, which is NCC, as, as well as what I would like to call as the self correlates, the deeper self. And the only way we can understand the correlates of the deeper self are by the refined human possibilities and the refined human capabilities such as uh, love for all, empathy, altruism, and so on. And that's why you would see that there's a lot of discussion on empathy and altruism in scientific disciplines you would not have thought about such a discussion happening in science perhaps 20 years back. But today, altruism is a concept which is of a lot of excitement in neurobiology. Of course, you know, even when you talk about altruism, it, it is in the context of uh, a, a, a evolutionary point of view. But still, people today agree that if we have to understand about a deeper, the deeper complexities of consciousness, we also have to bring in the capabilities that we have, we possess, which perhaps we do not know much, namely empathy, deeper empathy and altruism, which perhaps also would allow us to understand the nature of the unitary being, you know, the diminishing of the limits of the me and the other divide. Uh, friends, I think we can share many more evenings uh, with very exciting stories about consciousness, both from science and philosophy and our ancient culture and philosophy uh, and uh, literature. But uh, uh, this evening is beautiful and uh, there is some more time left and I think there would be some discussion and interaction. So I would like to stop here, but only these words, but I... I'm sure that this is a journey which is onward and there is no stopping here. So let us continue the journey and I thank you all once again for your very silent patience and bearing with me for all these words. And once again, my heartfelt gratitude to the Honorable President for having me here and to be blessed by this beautiful campus and the Mystic Campus. Thank you so much. Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, there are at least four ideas which our friends have expressed. Maybe I'll just uh, reiterate one. Uh, one is, uh, are there various dimensions of consciousness? Is the psychic uh, capability different from um, brain? That was one question. And is there a scientific uh, 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 explanation for uh, abilities such as uh, precognition and clairvoyance and so on and uh, the very beautiful uh, statement from the gentleman here saying do we have to always pause uh, uh, things existing uh, you know in consciousness or are we is consciousness existing in something or are, uh, can we say that we are perhaps existing in the world is existing in consciousness and I think the last question is where there is a left and right brain. Well, uh, perhaps we can have some uh, common answers for this. Uh, I think uh, it's extremely important, at least at some point, to realize that though our pedagogical method, the way we are trained to understand and acquire knowledge, always says that uh, you are creating consciousness or you are responsible for something which is deeper and complex rather than the other way. So, 
it's extremely important, at least at some point, perhaps to do a reverse thinking that uh, perhaps the smaller existence which we understand in terms of our bodily existence, our psychological existence, can it be understood in the context of a larger, deeper consciousness? So that's definitely a possibility, but how far science will progress towards is yet to be seen. Uh, well, parapsychology, as some of you would know, that it is uh, still a valid discipline, but uh, how much of is it in the mainstream science is uh, anybody's guess. Uh, lots of experiments and works have been done in terms of precognition, clairvoyance, etc. And some, and of, of course, as you said, uh, uh, remembering past life, etc. But uh, at least some of my yes, I'm coming to you, sir. I'll come to you. At least some of my friends from parapsychology uh, believes that uh, science has to progress much more in order to give a legitimate uh, answer to the possibilities of such experiences. Um, well, is there a left and right brain? I think um, uh, what is understood is that some part of the brain is designated for certain capabilities and certain uh, some one, uh, one part of the brain is designated for certain other experiences, certain other capabilities. But increasingly what is found is such a divide perhaps is more of a conceptual divide than a truly functional divide because the brain is a highly networked organ and any time you have an experience or you exhibit a particular perceptual cap uh, ability, many parts of your brain work together at the same time. So the brain is not a perhaps a, a located, a kind of a, it's not a, lo a, a localized mechanism producing certain capabilities, but it's a highly networked complex organ. Yes. Yes. Sorry? This is a very legitimate concern and perhaps you are partially right, but perhaps you are partially wrong as well. Because uh, the expression of anything which is deeper has to be understood in the current. Everything cannot be in the past. You and I are still living a life which is in the present. We have to actualize the expressions of such deeper thoughts of Jiddu Krishnamurti and other philosophers in our day-to-day -day life. And science is something which we cannot keep away in our day-to-day -day life. You need a car or you need some system of transport to come here. At least you need a healthy pair of legs to come here, to walk, right? And if your legs are not working, you have to have help from a qualified medical practitioner. Set them thinking. Sorry? I think it was one of the most, uh, it's definitely a very exciting thing. Yeah, and it has been a very rewarding evening. Microphone. It has been a very rewarding evening at least for me and most of us. I would like to add only one thing before thanking Dr. Menon, that the discussions which are, many times this emerges on what you mean by consciousness. I remember I was looking to the dictionary for defining consciousness and one dictionary defined consciousness as awareness. Then I went to the word awareness, what is awareness? It says to be conscious of. <laughs> and we keep on debating what it is about. I think there's more time what she has mentioned to reflect back, keep silent, think upon it. Thank you very much.